So it's nice to go back to theory sometimes and do something uh, that you can do uh, with paper and pencil, uh, maybe in your own garden. <laughs> and um, so this is basically the result of uh, such an effort is what you are going to hear in the, uh, in the next hour. So I talked to you about Atlantic regimes. Um, I showed you how you can find them, you can detect them um, in the observations or in the models, and how you can re relate the frequency to forcing anomalies in the tropics. But the question remains, and I was asked the question, do we have a, dynamical, a good dynamical explanation for these regimes? So OK, we find these clusters, but is there a, a dynamical reason why these clusters should, should be separated? Now, in the, uh, in the past, people have looked at quasi-geostrophic models, and they found things basically similar to, uh, to what um, Votar and, and Le Graf found. So you can have regimes in the Atlantic, for especially different phases of the Arctic oscillation, just uh, because of interaction with the eddies in quasi-geostrophic models. But they are relatively weak, and I was never been totally sure that this was the only explanation. And what actually was striking to me was is that in the North Atlantic, during winter, there's, there's such a strong thermal forcing you know, for the contrast between the cold continents, you know, Canada, and, and, and then you know, the relatively warm ocean in the region of the western boundary current. And so the question is how that plays. And uh, um, so there was, yeah, there, there are theories about thermal equilibration planetary ways. I, you know, we discussed them with John when I was doing my, my thesis uh, with him. But we, within quasi-geostrophic models, um, yeah, you can find something, but as, as I say, it's difficult to relate it specifically to, to an observed pattern. So what we try to do here is to have a very simple model for the North Atlantic oscillation regimes. So can we explain the fact that the North Atlantic oscillation has two separate regimes? So the starting point is that, OK, you, you can construct many models, but of course, you, you know, hopefully, you want to explain what happens in the real world. So the first step was to try to look for some specific processes that can create this regime behavior. And as you have heard at the beginning of the week, to have a regime behavior, you must have a balance between a positive feedback and a negative feedback. Because basically, you need, you need an instability. So in order to have a bimodal distribution, it means that when the system is around here, there will be some instability that will bring the system either in this direction or in this direction. And on the other hand, once you are in this point, if you move further down here, then you need some restoring force that will bring you the system back. So you need an instability and some damping, some dissipation terms. Now, in linear systems, if both the unstable and the stable part are linear, they will combine and the result will be that either you have an unstable mode or you have a stable system. In nonlinear system, you can make this feedback dependent on the state itself. So in particular, if this instability actually decreases gradually, then basically you reach a state where the restoring force may win and bring the system back. So, this, so you need these, these two ingredients. So the first thing was somehow to try and find which are these two ingredients that matter for the North Atlantic oscillation. OK, so I employ the same sort of uh, covariance techniques uh, that I had used for the teleconnection studies that I, I showed before. And I started by defining an NAO index. And since I think my interest was to basically look at NAO in the context of 
this possibly this wave number two pattern. Um, what we did was not to use maybe the traditional Iceland minus Lisbon index or, or some local ones, but something that would really look at the structure of the planetary waves on, on a wider scale. So we defined the index of the, as the difference in geopotential height between uh, two boxes, basically uh, one covering this area here and one covering this area here. If you do that, uh, you have an index of the NAO, uh, you standardize this index, and you can compute covariances with various fields. So let's start with the simple ones, your potential height at 500. Well, this is just the result of how you have defined the index, and you have a pattern that looks like the traditional uh, NAO definition. Now, uh, if you do that with um, your potential height at 850 instead of 500, um, well, you get a pattern which is very similar, almost in phase, uh, slightly smaller amplitude. And if you look at the difference between the two, basically that gives you the mean temperature in the lower troposphere, and that is what you get. And again, uh, perhaps you, you see a bit more structure here, but roughly the position of the low and the high here is, is roughly similar. So this tells you that this NAO anomaly has a, roughly an equivalent barostropic structure. So the temperature and the stream function line are, are in phase with, with each other. Now, you can also see that most of the signal is actually in this half of the hemisphere. So you can draw a line at 135 west and 45 east and actually look at what happens in this part of, of the world. And a justification for this is that if you, if you actually do a zonal mean, of these fields, uh, then what you get is, uh, is the blue line. So for example, you, you see that the zonal mean geopotential gradient is increased during a positive NAO uh, between roughly uh, 35 north and 65 north. And so you have an increase in the strength of the zonal wind in this region. And you have opposite signals to the north and, and to the south. Similar thing at 850. And you can see this mainly comes from the temperature. You know, in the temperature, you, you, you see basically an increase in the, um, so you have a stronger uh, zonal mean gradient of temperature. So temperature decreases faster with latitude during a positive NAO. Now, what are the green lines? The green lines are what happens if you only consider the contribution from this half. So. If you just set the other half to zero, and you can see that you get almost the same thing. So this amount justifies the fact that we can study our North Atlantic oscillation basically just concentrating um, on what happens in this uh, part of, uh, of the world. So if we um, think about something which is roughly zonal wave number two structure when you look at the whole hemisphere, then it becomes basically just a wave number one in this half of, of the hemisphere. Now, an important thing about, I think this is the real crucial point of, of the whole theory. An equivalent barotropic anomaly cannot affect temperature because the, uh, the stream function lines and the isotherms coincide. So you, know, you, you, you have, um, if you have a low, you also have a cold anomaly. Okay? So the flow just goes, follows the iso lines of temperature, and by definition, you have no temperature advection. So in order to have transport of heat by the horizontal flow, you need to have a baroclinic structure, so one where the stream function and the temperature are not in phase. Now, what happens is that, sorry, we are here. So the NAO anomaly is roughly equivalent and barotropic, but this NAO anomaly is superimposed to climatological stationary waves which are not equivalent barotropic. 
So if you actually plot, so, and I took the, um, the stationary waves at 850 hectopascal in DJF uh, for this latest 30 years or so. And what you see here are a plot of meridional velocity, V, and temperature. Now, if uh, the structure was equivalent barotropic, then this would be out of phase with, with each other. But actually, you can see that there are regions here, and here, here, and here, where they have the same sign. This means that if you do the product of this field, these are only the eddy fields, so the stationary waves. So if you multiply this by this, the result is positive. So this tells you that the stationary waves transport heat to the north. So when you think about the effect of an NAO anomaly, even if the NAO anomaly is equivalent barotropic, it can still change the heat transport because it's superimposed to stationary, the rest of the, of the stationary waves. Uh, you, you can see here that while the NAO anomaly, you, you remember, has a dipole in this direction, this, these stationary waves have a broader meridional scale. So you have, you have the same sign almost you know, from 17 or to, to, to 20. So what happens if an equivalent barotropic anomaly with the dipole structure in the y direction interacts with a baroclinic wave, which is baroclinic, but it has a broader meridional scale. So here is, is our uh, an idealized version. So you have, um, now we are just looking at this 135 west to 45 east sector. Um, so this, at the top, you have an idealized representation of temperature and V in an equivalent barotropic anomaly with the dipole structure, like the NAO. So this is our sort of NAO-like anomaly. And, and then you have the stationary waves with the broader meridional scale, like this one. And while the equivalent barotropic anomaly has the V and the T out of phase, we have seen that in the real climatology, the V and T actually are positively correlated. So I have only put a, a, just a 15 degree shift between these fields, okay? So these are idealized pure sinusoidal functions. Now, what happens if you compute the products? So this is the result. Uh, so basically you can decompose the anomaly into the product of the anomaly in V times the climatology in T plus the uh, climatology in V times the temperature anomaly. And because of this particular structure, so while, in, again, in an equivalent barotropic anomaly, these two terms would exactly cancel each other, because the climatology is not equivalent barotropic, the VAT Klim term dominates. And so the, the result is that in the total, the total result is that a an positive NAO anomaly would actually increase the heat transport around 60 no, between 60 and 70 degrees north. So if we do the uh, zonal mean of this, you get this curve, and this curve has two zero point. Why it has two zero point? One is that because the climatological temperature eddy goes to zero here. So that gives you this zero. And this zero occurs because the V <coughs> goes to zero in the middle of, of the channel, the V of, of the anomaly. While around 65 to 70 degrees north, uh, you have these strong peaks that dominate the negative ones, and you have this. So this is the V star T star. Now, to get the, the, the temperature tendency, you need to take the Y derivative of this. And so if you look at this part 
here is zero, here is zero. So the, the, the mean derivative in the southern part of the channel is, is zero. While the derivative in the northern part of the channel is positive and very strong. So this means that the NAO anomaly will hardly change the temperature in the southern part of the channel, but it will cool the northern part. So if you cool the northern part and you don't change the southern part, you, you increase the zonal mean wind. So basically, what we are telling is that the, uh, the eddy part of the NAO anomaly is able to reinforce the zonal mean part of the NAO anomaly. So uh, an eddy will actually, the eddy configuration that the observation is found together with the increase in zonal mean wind is actually able to increase the zonal mean wind by transporting heat to the north. Now, this is an idealized case. Now, what happens if you look at the real world? So I've just left the V star, T star panels there. So these are the equivalent maps derived from observed data. So again, you, you do the covariance of the NAO index with V, you do it with T, you do the product, and this is what you get. And again, so this is the product of uh, V star from the NAO anomaly times T star from the stationary waves. Uh, this is the other term, which is smaller. The result is dominated by this term. And the curve of the meridional heat transport has these two zero points and the maximum around 65 to 70 degrees north. So the simple framework explains what is the effect of, of the NAO on the zonal mean flow. So this gives us our positive feedback, because you, know, you have an NAO anomaly in the eddies. This, this actually is able to increase the zonal wind, which is also associated with the positive NAO. Now we need the negative feedback. The negative feedback is provided by the surface, the heating associated with the surface influxes. Now we can actually write uh, uh, the surface, the turbulent heat fluxes, which, is, which are the sum of um, sensible and latent heat flux, basically as a flux of moist static energy at, at the surface. And the standard uh, aerodynamic bulk formula will tell you you, you have a coefficient, you multiply it by the density of the air, and you multiply it by the wind speed at the surface, and then the difference in uh, basically moist static energy between the surface and the atmosphere just above the surface. Now, usually, uh, in many simplified models, you can actually represent this heating by neglecting the variability in, uh, um, in surface mean wind. You say, well, that's climatological, you have fixed. And, and so you can you probably neglect the, um, the term associated with latent heat, and then you have a simple linear damping of, of temperature. This looks fine. But actually, if you look at what actually happens in the North Atlantic, you find that the surface is fluxes are mainly driven by the variation in the surface wind speed. So if I now uh, compute the covariance of the 10 meter U wind with the NAO anomaly, then you get, well, what, what we expect. So stronger zonal winds, basically, in, in the mid-latitudes. So westerly anomaly here, easterly anomaly in the tropics. The corresponding variation in the surface heat fluxes is this. And you can explain a lot of this structure by just basically adding a positive anomaly to the climatological surface winds. So basically, wherever you have a positive anomaly superimposed to positive westerlies, you increase the zonal wind and you increase the heat fluxes. In this case, the heat fluxes are upwards. When the positive anomaly is superimposed to climatological easterlies, you have a negative. When the anomaly easterlies are superimposed to 
uh, easterlies, climatological easterlies, the trade winds, uh, again, you have positive. So this is a famous triple in heat fluxes that drives the, SS, the triple in SST anomaly, which is associated with the NAO. Now, this is the covariance with this NAO index. But you can basically get almost the same pattern if instead of doing the NAO index, you just take the mean, zonal mean, U wind at 850 as your index. And you basically correlate this with the heat fluxes. And what you get is this. So basically, it tells you that over, over the Atlantic, if you know the strength of the zonal mean westerlies, you basically know the intensity and distribution of the surface heat fluxes to, to a pretty large extent. And that's because it's the variation in, in the wind speed that dominates the variability in, in the heat fluxes. Now, OK, so we, <coughs> the heat fluxes will put heat into the atmosphere. And this is, again, the, you know, the, the uh, temperature anomaly at 850, which is associated with a positive NAO. And if you actually compare the temperature with the heating, you see that these two anomalies are negatively correlated. You can see here there are some profiles. So the, uh, the red line is the heating produced by these heat fluxes. The blue line is the temperature anomaly. And OK, there's not an exact anti-correlation, but clearly there is an anti-correlation, which means that this gives you a negative feedback. So you, you increase the zonal wind, you increase the surface heat fluxes, but these heat fluxes actually project negatively onto the NAO anomaly, both on the zonal part and the eddy part. And so this will give you a negative feedback. OK, so now we have the ingredients. We have the positive feedback and the negative one, and we can try to put them together. And so uh, again, we'll try to do it in the simplest possible way. We have a channel that covers this sector that I've described. And as in many uh, lower order model, you just have three degrees of freedom, one for the strength of the zonal mean wind, and one for the wave. Now, the difference with respect, for example, to the Charney de Vore is that the Charney de Vore uh, channel was actually a closed channel. So the, the, the wave was designed in such a way that you had zero meridional fluxes at the boundaries, which may be desirable. But actually, here, the crucial point is actually what happens at the boundary. And the NAO anomaly actually has the, the largest amplitude at this extreme. So this is what I would call, call an open channel. And of course, so you might argue, well, in an open channel, things can also come from other things may come from the boundary. So that's why we call it a heuristic model, because okay, we assume that it's fine to describe what happens in the channel. So if you believe me, then basically um, you want to describe what happens to the stream function in this channel. So you have a mean zonal flow minus UY. You have a wave pattern which is associated with the NAO, which is described by this wave. And in particular, this phase, this particular phase of the wave um, has this uh, low here over Greenland. So it looks like the NAO anomaly. And this actually is more in phase with the forcing, with the thermal forcing, because at high latitudes, it, has, it is cold over Canada and warm over the ocean. So the, the, the climatological lengthy contrast will project onto this pattern. But what we want to know is what happens to this phase, which looks like the NAO. Then what we have to consider are the interactions of this wave with a wave of larger meridional extent, so the, the, the wider scale component of the stationary waves. And I've shown you this is important because this will give you the feedback onto the mean zonal flow. So the first thing is, OK, let's just consider the first element. That is just the advection. Linear advection, uh, this is standard planetary wave theory. You have just one mode. So the mode does not have interactions with itself, so it just interacts with the zonal wind. And so you can use this. You can basically describe it um, evolution by a simple uh, barotropic uh, uh, vorticity advection, 
where the, the Laplacian of the stream function is, is, is the vorticity and its derivative is basically given by the advection of, of uh, relative vorticity by the zonal wind plus the transport of planetary vorticity, which is the beta term. Simple standard you find in all textbooks, Holton, Wallace and Hobbes, whatever. So because your wave is, a simple wave is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian, uh, you can further simplify uh, this equation, and so the evolution of the stream function is basically proportional, proportional to, its horizon, to, to its zonal gradient multiplied by the difference between the two winds. One is the actual zonal wind, and this is the value of the zonal wind that will make the wave stationary. So the wave will become stationary if this is zero, okay? So this beta over n square, where n square is basically the, uh, the total wave number of the wave, when this is zero, the, um, the wave is stationary. So if we now redefine, if we define a u prime variable as the um, difference of u from this stationary value, and you also um, assume uh, a time scale um, of about 23 days, that will show you why. Uh, basically, you, if you project this equation onto the simple mode, you get some very, a very simple cycle. Okay, so the A is uh, increased by the advection of B, and B is decreased by the advection of A. So this will give you a simple propagation. And this uh, factor alpha depends on the time scale you have assumed. So you, we can choose this time scale uh, in order to make this alpha coefficient equals to 1, so we can drop it from the equation. So, so if A and B doesn't have any spatial uh, A and B are the two phases of, of this wave. So A is the coefficient that multiplies the NAO pattern. And B is the coefficient that multiplies the pattern, which is just in phase with the length C contrast. It must be a 90 degree phase difference. They are, exactly, and they are at 90 degrees. So OK, so we start from here. But then we have to add more terms. And we have seen that what we have to take into account is the divergence of the meridional heat transport the thermal dissipation to, due to the heat fluxes, and in addition, you will have some radiative damping. Okay? So we have seen that the divergence of the meridional heat transport is a positive feedback. So if the NAO is in the positive phase, so if A is positive, the U wind is increased. So in the equation for, for U prime, uh, you get uh, uh, A multiplied by a positive coefficient. Then we have to reproduce the effect of the fluxes. The fluxes will be somehow proportional to the zonal wind anomaly, but they will amp as a, act as a damping. So this H term has a negative sign in the equation. And then you have some uh, simple relaxation towards an equilibrium, a radiative equilibrium. Now, at this point, you need to estimate this gamma and, and, and sigma coefficients. And you can actually do it from, from the covariances that I have shown you. One can actually compute, assuming the scaling of the what values these parameters should have. And also for the radiative damping, you, you can basically estimate the, <coughs> the anomaly in long wave radiation associated with the given temperature anomaly. And if you do that, I have no time to go to the calculations, you end up that gamma is roughly equal to 2, sigma is also <coughs> roughly equal to 2, while the, <coughs> the radiative damping is about 0 0.5, which means that basically the surface heat fluxes give you an anomaly of 40 watts per square meter. The radiative anomaly will give you a flux of about 10 watts per square meter. So, the radiative time scale will be four times 
So the time scale is basically the inverse of, of these coefficients. So this basically tells you, if we, since the time scale here is, is uh, 20 days uh, in order to get rid of this alpha term, if you have time scales for the um, heat flux conversions and the heating by the surface flux is of about 10 days, this will give you a coefficient of about 2. Just to understand, yeah. A is kind of string function. And A, B, yes. B could be kind of uh, V. The, the U is the meridional gradient. The B is also a string function. But A and B uh, must be uh, 90 degrees yeah. difference. Yes. But in that case, you don't need A and B. Just, uh, you, you just relate A and B with a 90 degree base uh, relationship. Is it OK? Yeah, but the revolution is still, so basically you, you, you have a cycle. So if you go back to the, in fact, this is what this, this equation tells you. Th that this is just a simple cycle between two phases of the waves that are at 90 degrees. So what the wind does is that it just moves this wave downstream. So basically this is the result of what, what you are saying, that because the waves are at 90 degrees from each other, then you have this simple oscillator which is driven by, by the advection. OK, so now we have put these other terms in. And the interesting thing is that <clears throat> if you do some simple transformation, so first of all, we can say, OK, um, we can actually check. That's another important element here. So in the equation for U, there is, a, there is a U star. So we assume that the, there will be some relaxation towards some climatological state. However, we have written the equation in terms of the deviation from the stationary value. So if the climatological state is almost identical to the value that will make this wave stationary, then it means that this U star will be 0. Now, if you compute what the stationary value is for this wave number two, it comes out to 12.8 meters per second. If you actually look at what the zonal mean wind in this channel is at 500 millibar height from area intimate reanalysis, you get 13.1. So they are really very close. So you can basically assume that U star is, is, is zero. And actually, this justifies our model because if this particular wave is close to stationarity. It means that it is quasi-resonant, and it can display a large low-frequency variability. So we can set U star to 0. Um, gamma is roughly equal to sigma, we have seen from observations. And so if we define B star as the difference between B, sorry, B prime as the difference between B and B star, then you get this particular system of three equations. And if you remember what I showed you for the Lorentz model, it's basically formally the same system. Can, can, can you explain for a second the difference? So why is A has a term Ka and the other two have a term that, um, that have this, this uh, difference with the statement? Yeah. Uh, because basically what, what I assume is that because I've chosen, you know, I've chosen B, I've chosen the phase of this wave so that the climatological state is just in phase with B and not with A. And A is the NAO and B is the... Yeah, so basically B is something which is in phase with the Lenzi contrast yeah. and the NAO is actually orthogonal, especially okay. orthogonal to the Lenzi contrast. So the Lenzi contrast will, will, create, will make a strong forcing on B, but will not make, by construction, a forcing on A. Okay. So this comes out, yeah, okay. if, if I had chosen a different phase, then you would have had forcing on both A and B. But simply because I've chosen the phase in such a way that just B is, is, in, is aligned with the Lenzi contrast, then um, yeah, you, you don't have an equivalent A star. 
Now, if you make this transformation, uh, you end up with a system which is that looks formally equivalent to the Lorentz model. And this b star minus sigma plays the same role as the r parameter in the Lorentz model. So basically, the, it's the parameter that forces, that determines the amplitude and the separation of, of the stationary solution. So basically, it tells you that it's the forcing in the, uh, in the planetary wave field, which projects, projects on b, that is the factor that determines the, the difference between the stationary states. Uh, the only difference is that this, these relative terms come, they are different between the different variables in the Lorentz model while we have basically the same coefficient in, along, uh, in all three equations. But okay, so if this is formally equivalent, uh, then you can expect that the attractor is similar in a suitable range of parameters. And well, if this B star determines the amplitude, yeah, you, you have to say, what, what is B star? Now, um, it's very difficult to say what is B star because it's a cumulative effect of thermal forcing, but also orographic forcing of the climatological waves. So here we took an empirical approach. We say, well, we can compute what the stationary solutions are as a function of B. And we know what the amplitude of the uh, typical NAO anomaly is, so we choose a value of b which is consistent with that. It turns out to be 12. So if you choose 12 and you integrate the system, well, you would expect that you get a Lorentz attractor. So basically, uh, and, and the green points here, so these are basically scatter diagrams of the uh, U-wind against the say an AO amplitude. Uh, this is the U wind versus the wave which is in phase with the with the lengthy contrast. And these are the two waves. And what you see on the left are time series for the three coefficients. Okay, it looks like the Lorentz model, so uh, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, so this will basically tell you that you will have two NAO regimes, one corresponding to stronger zonal wind and the positive phase of the A wave, and one corresponding to weaker zonal wind and the negative phase of, of the wave. Um, and the green points are given by the stationary solutions. Well, there's one stationary solution, which is, again, zero motion, like in the Lorentz model, and then two stationary solutions, which are weakly un unstable. OK, the point is, what happens if you change B? That's interesting, but that, that would bring us to <laughs> Uh, a lot of other lectures. Now, what this model describes are just basically just the interaction between the planetary waves and the zonal flow. Now, people may argue, well, but you know, there are a lot of studies that uh, point out that in the Atlantic, the regimes interact strongly with the baroclinic waves. And uh, in fact, if you actually think at the traditional view of the atmospheric energy cycle, the view is that basically the energy transformation are mainly driven by baroclinic eddies. There are no stationary waves in this scheme, even if, as we have seen, planetary waves transport heat and therefore convert energy. But so, so the traditional view is that you put diabatic heating, you create zonal mean available potential energy. Somehow, the, you know, the, the forcing um, of the circulation will actually turn this zonal available potential energy into eddy potential energy. Then the baroclinic eddies will convert this eddy potential energy into eddy kinetic energy. And then when the baroclinic eddy decay, then this kinetic energy is transformed back into kinetic energy of the zonal mean flow. So there were a, a couple of very nice uh, papers uh, by Martin Anbaum and Lenka Novak. Um, they were actually presented here at ICDP about one year ago during the Open IFS uh, workshop. And in fact, I, I have to give credit to them because it's the <laughs> heuristic model that gave me, with the, you know, uh, that challenged me to, to, to find this 
simple you know, NAO model. Basically, what they were interested in was in a much simpler problem. So just the interaction between the zonal mean flow and the, the integrated amplitude of baroclinic eddies. And what they developed is a simple nonlinear oscillation, which is analogous to the predator-prey model, <coughs> where basically the amplitude of the eddies grows at the expense of the available potential energy of the zonal mean flow. Um, and on the other hand, the growth of the eddies uh, due to barotropic instability is proportional to uh, the, bar the baroclinity itself. So high baroclinity makes the growth of the uh, eddies faster, but in the end, the eddies extract uh, at the uh, sorry, a start zone available potential energy, so the baroclinity decreases, and then you have a nonlinear oscillation. And what uh, they've actually estimated the lag between the growth of the uh, of the baroclinic edits, which was quantified by the heat flux, the meridional heat flux, and the baroclinity, which was uh, basically an index of static st zonal mean static stability, and they found some lag, uh, so the the the, the eddy growth legs by, after a couple of days, the maximum in, in baroclinity, and you have a nonlinear oscillation. So if this is an important mechanism, and as they have argued, you might say, well, you know, your model doesn't take this into account at all. So uh, what happens if, in fact, there are baroclinic eddies that go at the expense of the zonal flow? So the minimal way to do that is that um, we can actually, you know, so far we have assumed an equivalent barotropic structure, so our zonal mean flow was just determined by one number. But you can be a bit more uh, specific and decompose the zonal mean wind into um, just the thermal part, which is proportional to uh, the horizontal temperature gradient. And that is basically what we were talking about before. And a fully barotropic part which is the same at all levels. And so at the surface, the zonal wind will actually be just the barotropic part. And so in this energy cycle, it means that the growth will, the eddies, baroclinic eddies will grow by extracting um, energy from uh, the zonal mean available potential energy, so they will decrease this component, but then they will put back energy uh, into this component of, of the flow. So you need one more variable here, and you need one more variable here. Now, there's definitely not the time to discuss in detail all the coefficients of this model. But basically, uh, what we have done is that we have added an equation for the barotropic part. This basically tells you that it, it, the barotropic part goes by the kinetic energy which is put by the decay of baroclinic eddies and then is done by surface friction. And the eddies actually go by extracting energy from the thermal part of the zonal wind and decay by surface friction and the barotropic conversion into the zonal wind flow. So these are basically two nonlinear oscillations like the ones that uh, Ambau and Novak have, have developed. So the question is, well, if you put if you add this, uh, these processes, will the attractor be totally destroyed, just be turned into a simple oscillation or not? And, well, I don't have time to go into the estimation of these parameters. In fact, it was done quite empirically, but the result is no. So the attractor is likely modified. Uh, so again, these are the scatter diagrams. Uh, the screen points just for reference are the stationary solution of the previous model. So you can see how the attractor is actually shifted with respect to its original position, but roughly the variability. So you, you still have the two regimes. What you have, of course, is more variability on subseasonal scales. Uh, and you have a variability in the zonal mean wind where first the thermal part grows, then the eddy grow. Uh, and then the eddy decay and the barotropic part grows. So you have actually three lines in the top diagram. These, again, are the two phases of the planetary waves. 
um, that have a bit more wiggles, but still they display this regime. And so actually, we can look at the relationship between this, the zonal mean at the eddies in more detail. First of all, uh, we can plot the amplitude of the eddies as a function of the thermal part of the zonal wind, so the, basically the baroclinity. And as we expect, uh, well, on average, there is a positive relationship. So when there is more baroclinity, you have stronger um, eddies. But if we look at the detail as the time relationship, uh, this is the, basically the lag correlation between the amplitude of the baroclinic eddies and in red, the thermal part of the wind, and in green, the barotropic part of the wind. And the, the axis, x-axis gives you the lag between the wind and the eddies. So this basically tells you that the eddies get larger about three days after the peak in the baroclinity. And then they start to decay. And then the, they put back energy into the barotropic part. So the barotropic part of the wind has its maximum uh, about five days after the peak in the baroclinic eddies. And you have an oscillatory behavior because you basically have to you know, nonlinear oscillators like the one by, by Ambau and, and, and Novak. OK, so we didn't want somehow, you know, this part uh, is it, basically just to, to demonstrate that this regime structure is not actually destroyed if you add the interactions by baroclinic eddies. Of course, you could, you could choose another way of specifying this, in, this interaction. But since this has been you know, quite discussed in the literature, um, we just wanted at least to have this, uh, um, this type of interactions in the model. So basically what we have seen is that the regimes in the NAO can exist because of the balance of a positive and negative feedback that involves the zonal, the eddy component of the NAO anomaly and the heat fluxes. The positive feedback is due to horizontal heat transport by the wave that interacting with climatological stationary waves, which are baroclinic, can actually modify uh, the transport at the northern edge of the channel and therefore can either increase or decrease the strength of uh, the thermal wind. The negative feedback is due to the thermal damping caused by the heating anomalies driven by surface fluxes. So, and because the surface fluxes are so dependent on the zonal wind speed, again, this becomes a, just a simple feedback between the strength of the zonal wind and then the thermal damping of the NAO anomaly. So adding these two feedbacks to a simple cycle, we just described the vorticity of action of the wave, then you get a three-variable model, which is formally equivalent to the Lorentz model. And therefore, like the Lorentz model, it has a chaotic attractor with two regimes. And that's nice. So we can say, well, there's some justification for assuming that positive NAO and negative NAO are real regimes. You can argue what happens if, in addition to just zonal wind and planetary waves, you add the effect of the baroclinic eddies. So we have used this simple theory developed you know, in, in previous papers to do that. And basically, this, the good news is that it doesn't destroy the chaotic attractor. It just puts basically more variability in the subseasonal scale. So that's almost work in progress. So we still have to <laughs> finally get it into, uh, into the literature. But we thought that, well, you know, this is a school of multiple equilibria. And so this was quite uh, you know, a fitting uh, topic for, for that. Uh, again, it's a very simplified model. You can say, well, it's a gross simplification of reality, as any simplified model is. But at least it gives you a conceptual, a conceptual framework uh, that somehow justifies these observational uh, results. The other thing that I can do is that because um, you know, the, the calculations that are done to estimate, for example, this gamma and sigma coefficients, these have been done on real data. You can do them on models. So for example, instead of just using these simple metrics that uh, we use to see whether our semi-5 or semi-6 Six models 
give a good representation of uh, you know, the, the mean in all the variables, we could actually compute these coefficients from the models and see whether they have the right strength of the positive and negative feedbacks. And because the regimes come out, because this gamma and, and sigma <laughs> are both similar and uh, they are both two. So it's their balance that gives these regimes. If one is dominant over the others, uh, you would get something very different. So, so in, in the future, we hope that we could actually repeat these just calculations of, of the strength of the feedback, maybe from model data. It might become boring. I, we don't know whether we will get anything out of it. <laughs> this could be a way of actually hopefully seeing whether the models have the right dynamics to reproduce DNA of regimes. And that concludes uh, my lecture. So thanks a lot for your attention.